G'day fans and welcome to another exciting episode of Talk Nerdy to Me. As I speak right now, all of Melbourne is out on the town except for us three, which is why there is not a single person watching us. Right, here we go, one person's joined us, there we go. It's feeling a bit left out there for a moment. Um, welcome everybody to the show from Facebook users and YouTube people as well. How exciting is that as we prepare or get ready for our big lockdown? Once again, I'm joined by my lads, uh, MPS and Jeffro. How are we tonight, laddies? Excellent. Yeah, not bad. Not, good, not good. because I'm in Melbourne, but I'm in Ballarat, so I'm really happy about that. Very good. MPS, what were you going to say? I'm all good. Just yeah. all good. What can I say? All right. So uh, it's nine o'clock. Oh, just, just after nine o'clock. Absolutely fantastic. People, you've still got three hours to get out and about if you live in the Melbourne metropolitan area to go enjoy your freedom before you're trapped in your homes for the next six long, boring weeks, except for the Wednesday nights when you come and join us. Um, all right. So we've got a bit of a natter uh, once again in these conversations. There's no mm -hmm. right or wrong. It's just still all about thoughts, views and opinions. And I thought I was going to come up with this idea about um, – with the COVID, well, actually start again, with the isolation lockdowns occurring at the moment uh, and uh, the world being a bit unhappy as it is. I was just curious to know if there's still room, and I'm just, I'm just putting this out there for a general discussion, is there still room for fan clubs uh, mm. in the world? Um, I've got a whole lot of views and thoughts on this, but I'm just going to pass it over to my lads to say, well, because um, MPS is still heavily involved in fan clubs, as I am, but Jeffro, not so much, but you did, you were once. Yeah, there. but I um, I was actually there sort of um, in the beginning, so I know what it was actually like before uh, fan clubs and such, so um, mm -hmm. I've got a few ideas about that. Cool, I'll start with you then. So um, what, are you, yeah. what are your thoughts? Is there still room for fan clubs in the world, mate? Well, I, I believe there is, and um, see, when I um, joined the world of fan clubs, that was back in about 79, and that was actually through Space 1999 Alliance and, and such. It was like a, a an international uh, club that had its newsletters and such. So it for me, even though there wasn't actually any uh, meetings that I could go to or anyone I could really interact with, uh, I still had that experience of being able to sort of get pen friends, if people do remember what they were like, and also uh, being able to sort of uh, have a feeling that there's that community. So even though we're all sort of spread across the world, I still got that feeling of community. And, and, and later on uh, in uh, 80, 81 and all that, uh, Blake Seven fandom exploded and there was uh, the fanzines and, uh, and the writing and all that. So, um, again, it was one of those things where you got uh, a lot of stuff that you can read, you could also participate. So even though, uh, you know, there was no sort of uh, physical meetings, you could participate in writing things and writing letters of comment or LOCs, if you remember that was the uh, initials and such. So uh, in, in many ways, I feel that today's fandom is very much like that. So even though people don't always get face to face, there's uh, uh, still a lot of interaction. So Instead of writing um, letters of comment, people might write comments on Discord. Uh, there's still a lot of fan fiction that goes on online, even though nobody actually prints the actual uh, uh, fanzines and such themselves. So, uh, and of course, uh, with pen friends and such, we don't really have pen <coughs> friends, but we have things like Facebook, where we can communicate and, and stay in touch, and it's probably a lot quicker to do that than uh, uh, writing out or typing, in my case, uh, actual letters. So uh, I think there is uh, still room for fandom, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in that sort of uh, phase where it's like uh, regular monthly meetings, and I loved those when <laughs> they were part of the, uh, the 80s and, and sort of through to the 90s before they eventually disappeared around sort of, I think, the early 2000s and in, in many cases where now it's picked up. But uh, for me, it was a case of uh, I think fan can exist without uh, having those those meetings because there's just so many other avenues. But 
uh, uh, for me, the, the physical monthly meetings and the weekly meetings and so that was really good because I was a very shy kid. So to be able to sort of communicate with other people that were sort of like minded, I think that's where for me, actually, um, I developed a lot of my social skills. And uh, that's something that uh, you can't really do uh, with fanzines and, and letters of comments and stuff like that. So that's my thoughts. Very good. Um, uh, and Aaron's written something very interesting. I'll read that out in a minute. MPS, is anything you want to chuck in? Yeah, I, I still think fan clubs are relevant um, for the simple fact that you have more human interaction. You, know, you can only do so much on, on a computer and you know, message so many people and, and all that sort of stuff. But when you're actually in a room with other people and you're all enjoying the same sort of thing, that's something a little bit more special. You know, and it can be doing whatever, you know, any of the, the fan clubs we have or if you're part of a sporting group or something like that, there's a bit of something else there that you don't get, you know. So, so for instance, maybe here's an example. So if we were in the same room together, the chemistry would be far different than us being on the screens. That's you know, probably the only way I can sort of explain it in, in simple terms. So, um, yeah, I still think there's a, a huge uh, value to the club and to go into meetings and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I think the younger generation are missing out. Yeah, that's roughly what uh, Aaron has said um, here. I think just put it up there so you can sort of see it. Uh, in real life, fan clubs seem mainly for people our age, um, and it's much more about catching up with old friends as being fans of the movies and TV shows. Um, that actually makes a great deal of sense because one of the things that I have picked up on in my time is that when I first got into the fan club scene, most of the people who were there were roughly my age, so like, you know, late teens, sort of into their mid-20s. And, of course, as you get older, um, I found that um, the average age increased. So suddenly it was in the 30s and the 40s. And the younger people, sorry, my cat's chewing stuff here, uh, the younger people weren't coming in to replace them. And that's currently the, the, the issue now. And I know it's not just with sci-fi fan clubs, it's with a whole lot of things, you know, a lot of um, areas that have... Um, hobbyists where younger people just aren't interested in that that sort of thing that sort of thing sorry I'm going to show you what this looks like this is what I have to put up with right can you see that here's my cat chewing knock it off, <laughs> knock it off. <laughs> sorry I just want you to know what the distraction is so they come out <laughs> so there we go say hello to all the people in the internet land oh, we found our super villain haven't we is the one with the cat <laughs> bloody bitch all right so uh where was I? yes and that's the thing is so a lot of the um uh, there's a lot no younger people coming in to replace uh, us older folk and i agree with aaron it more is definitely a lot more about the socialization uh and catching up with people rather than saying oh we're here to talk about movies and we're here to talk about the tv shows because a lot of us don't necessarily just walk in sit down in the audience and go all right entertain me uh and i think that's a key thing um jeffrey did you want to jump yeah, in with something i just wanted to um uh point out a uh, comment that Kel had made, and I totally agree with him in terms of uh, the professional uh, conventions are very much awful. And the reason for that is because you've got, you know, thousands upon thousands of people in one area. So there's there's no way you can really sort of get to like uh, know people because there's such a crowd. It's like almost like trying to make friends at a, a big footy match. Whereas, you know, if it's something like a, a regular meeting where the numbers, you know, sort of uh, you know, 30, 40, 50, what have you, you can feel like you can get to know people and such. So I I really thought that was a telling comment. I mean, if you've got thousands and thousands of people, there's very little chance you're going to walk away having new friends. You may well see people that you know there, but it's it's not really a, a social environment. So that's my thoughts. I like what Aaron has said. Sorry, just quickly about his son, not interesting meeting people face to face and just rather meet them online. And that's the key, clearly a, the big issue with the modern day world. Uh, why leave your house uh, when you can um, just connect with everybody online? I'll tell a very funny story in a moment, but NPS, you can go first with what you want to say. I was going to say, I'm going to disagree with what um, was said because I know of many stories of people who've met up at the big cons uh, and have become friends out of it. But I don't know them personally. Uh, back when I was in the States uh, four years ago, I was at Rancho Obi-Wan. And they were doing, there was two guys doing an interview with Steve Sansquid at the time for their podcast. And they met up, they lived in two opposite ends of the country in the US, and they met up in line 
waiting for something to, to go into something at celebration and they became friends through that and then they yeah. they started a podcast together so i've heard stories of it it's not a common occurrence you know like you know we can't if we walk into oztrek we can name pretty much all of our friends who are there and and all that sort of stuff and we know who we we're, we're not as friendly with because we don't know them or whatever the case is but you know you're right to a point you know you go to thirty thousand people convention you're not going to know every single person there I tend to think the uh, the key part of that is in line because basically you are standing in one place, you have nowhere to go, you're standing next to another human being, so what else are you going to do? You're going to be able to chat. So I think a lot of people have said, oh, yeah, I've made friends standing in, in line. I remember Steel Saunders saying, you know, he met many of his friends just standing in line waiting to, to go into Hall H, but at a, at a sort of a big convention where, you know, you're moving around, I think it's a very much a different story. But when you're forced to, you know, be in one place, of course you're going to speak to the, the people next to you. Uh, how could you not? Mm. Uh, and a lot, a lot of them are also met because they're in costume. So they walk up to someone and they say, I love your costume, and then they start talking and they go from there. I've heard a lot of stories like that too. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting one for sure, and I agree with what uh, Colin said. That I think it's so many. Yeah, it's hard to attract younger uh, members in the, in the way the world is currently. Here in Melbourne, we're actually very, very lucky, very lucky, because we still have at least four social clubs now. Admittedly, they're all shut down because of the COVID thing, but when they're on operation, they're all still active and quite operational. Now, you look at Sydney, for example, which is of equal population to here, and they only have a couple uh, of fan clubs that are still running with social events, and of course, one of them is Star Walking, so it's actually run by Melbourne doing Sydney meetings. And uh, But they don't have a Star Trek group up there anymore. That's long since gone. I think they still have a Doctor Who club up there. Uh, even Friends of Science Fiction, I think, closed down a long time ago. But I'll just, there's a couple of there's all these stories I could tell you, but there's one in particular that just spun me right out. So, to show just how lucky we are and how grateful uh, we should be about being able to have these uh, social events with clubs, um, I've been in contact with the guy who has the largest Batman collection in the world. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia, in America. And I actually asked him, now, this is a guy who's got the biggest collection, right? He's obviously a super huge fan and all the rest of it. And I said, Well, what fan clubs do you hang out with over there? And he said, There aren't any. Right, this is a major U.S. American city, and and I was really surprised to hear that. And I said, "Well, have you actually thought of maybe trying to start one up? Because clearly you've got the passion, you've got the interest." And one, and he actually said he did try once to put the word out to all these people, and said, "Okay, come along, we'll get together, we'll you know talk about Batman and whatever else." And only one person showed up, and he said it was socially really, really awkward. at this complete stranger turn up, and they just it was like they didn't know how to gel, right? And and in the end, this guy Brad. Uh, he said that everybody he knows who's interested in this stuff is all on the internet. So he has physically not a single person he can turn to and say, hey, come over, let's just chat about mm. stuff, show you my stuff, let's just you know, hang out, you know, swig a couple of Coca-Colas and just talk about man. He's got nobody. And this is in a major American city. And you could argue that even if as of tomorrow, you know, crisis is notwithstanding, if somebody said, oh, let's create something in America, in Atlanta, for, uh, for example, it's too late. It, 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 the time has passed because the social side, the social media side has now taken over. And um, I was just really, really surprised to hear that. That's why here in Melbourne, we're actually very, very lucky. We've still got clubs that are still hanging in there. Uh, and hanging in there is probably not far from the truth because, you know, some of them, they're not necessarily expanding, but they're not collapsing either. They've sort of got this plateau that they sort of work at. It's a small one, but at least it's still there. And I think that's a key thing to uh, keep in mind. Yeah, what what I find interesting is that uh, the way Greg mentioned about the fact that there was a, a Doctor Who fandom in, in Bendigo, and I mean, it's not a big uh, place by all means, but there is a fandom. So the fact that there is uh, organised social events and activities in a, a smallish country town like Bendigo, but in Atlanta, they can't do sweet FA. So it's like, you know, here is a small town doing it all. And, you know, a, a big place in America that just can't do nothing. I just thought that was very ironic. Yeah. Well, when, Dag, when Dags and I were in the U.S. a couple of years ago, I took him to the um, LASFS, the Los Angeles Science and Fantasy Society. And I think he was expecting there to be hundreds of people because it's, mm. it's Los Angeles. How many thousand people live in L.A. Mm. alone? A couple of, you know, five or six million, whatever the case is. And to think that there was only a handful of people in this club room that was the oldest science fiction fan club in the world you know you would think and uh, do you remember seeing anyone younger than sort of us i i don't recall there might have been one no yeah you're right there were 
obviously a lot older, not not, not elderly, but yeah, around our age or older. Yeah, but yeah. Elderly too, you know, um, um, most of them were sort of you know getting towards the MSFC mm -hmm. type of age, but yeah, there was not anyone young coming through the ranks. So per, based on per capita, um, Melbourne says so in the MSFC. Uh, has X amount of people turn up to an event. You know, I, I haven't been there for a while, so let's assume like 15, maybe a, a dozen, right? Per capita, you're right, MPS, the LA one should have had maybe 80 or 90 people turn up because there's millions of hundreds, well, hundreds of millions, whatever, of people living in Los Angeles. But there wasn't. They were almost on a par between the numbers, between the Melbourne version and the LA version, and that didn't make any sense at all. So it's a very interesting um, uh, observation. Um, Aaron, I like what Aaron said. You're right, right, Aaron. In our day, we were a lot younger and we had a lot more time on our hands, and there's also about priorities as well. So people's priorities... Uh, change as they get older and they get involved with families, relationships, mortgages, whatever else. And that's understandable too. Um, and hence the reason why people will always come and go from a club. Uh, what you don't want is for the numbers to drop off and not have those people replaced. And that's the issue. They're not being replaced by younger people. It's all the old, us old farts just keeping the, the lights on, as it were, which then prompt the question is like, well, how long can these things keep going for? Or will there come a time when everything just changes around and all these young people say, you know what, this would be a great place uh, to go to uh, and to check out. And I've got to share a story with you now. Do, it's a bit of a long story. So do either you two want to chuck something in before I start? No? All right. So this is the early, this is a, a sign of the times, right? So this is the early 2000s, about 2000, 2001 uh, at Skyforce. And if you're a Star Wars fan, there's a whole online forum called the Jedi Council Forum, okay? And they've got all these different things that they talk about and they break everything down into regions. And you've got Australia, which is Oceania, all the different states, and you've got Victorian fan force. And there were all these young people on there. They're like all school students. And uh, they're obviously all Star Wars fans. You know, this is in the time when Phantom Menace had come out and Attack of the Clones was on the way and whatever else. And myself and another guy were telling these guys, if you're Star Wars fans, why don't you turn up to a club meeting, Skyforce. At the time, Skyforce was very big and popular, and it took ages and ages and ages of pressuring these people and say, get your asses to this thing, you're going to love it. Eventually, right, they get to a time, and they say, beauty, we'll all go, right? And I'm not kidding, I because I was the only one, aside from the other guy, who knew who these people were going to be. So this is when Skyforce was having over 100 people at a meeting. I turn up, and there's eight people, the young people, standing there next to each other, not saying a single word, right? They were lost sheep. And I picked up straight away who they were. And I go, oh, you guys are all the Victorian fan force guys, right? And what happened is they were so insulated amongst themselves. They hadn't met before. So they're trying to work out, well, who are you? Who are you? And who are you? And who are you? And in the end, they had nothing to say, right? They preferred a screen and a keyboard to have all their conversations. Face to face, they just shut right down, right? Because they were all so, um, uh, what's the word, uh, introverted. And I couldn't believe it. And I said, you all know each other. You've been talking for over a year Talk to me, and they were standing right in front of them. Say something, and they were just lost. And what happened is that after that gig, so the eight of them turned up. The next meeting, five turned up, and uh, actually, sorry, it was three. And after that, one, and that one person stuck around for an extra two meetings before she left. So they all bolted, and in the end, they couldn't handle it. They could not handle face to face communication, even though every single person in that meeting was a Star Wars fan, and they could have turned to any of them. And just walked up and said, hey, what do you think of that movie? Can you help me out? I'd love to talk about collectibles or whatever. And they didn't. They couldn't handle it. And they all went back to the online thing. And I thought, and that was then. That was almost 20 years ago. And uh, and I was, I was so disappointed. And I thought, and they were young then. So they're obviously adults now. And they've obviously long since moved on. But um, that was definitely a sign of the times uh, back then. So, uh, um, yeah, I just I couldn't believe it. So, anyway, there's my story. Yeah, I thought... Um, um I thought Aaron. Jeff, made can a, you check your microphone? Cause you're actually quite soft. Have you moved it, or have you sitting further no, away? No, it's still the way it is. I'll, I'll speak a bit louder. So um, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, mate. Yep, uh, go on. I thought Aaron made a very good point before about the fact that uh, uh, these social events really rely on someone actually organising them. And I mean, mm -hmm. in a fan club environment, it's not for profit, so people have to go to a lot of effort to be able to set these things up. So. Uh, it's going to get to the point where people like Philip Nichols and Greg King and all that um, are, are going to be able to sort of have to retire one day and then where will the social events be? You know, will someone step up? Uh, will we find somebody? But we're all getting older and, and sort of uh, I guess those people that are going to commit to that kind of thing are going to have to retire soon and, and then where will we? That's the big question. Yeah, because I was surprised that, like, in Sydney when the Star Trek club closed down up there, there's a long story as to what happened and why 
but it never got rejuvenated after uh, it could have just been had like a rebirth. And uh, this is Aztrex. And at the time, Aztrex uh, was the second oldest Star Trek club in the world, beat, beaten by the was it, was Star Fleet Command by about three months. Can you believe it? So it was founded in 1973. Um, and I would have thought, oh, that's right. It, it can just come back to life and then just kick off from where it was. And it, and it didn't. And this, we're talking like nearly 19, 18 years ago. And uh, and as of today, it still doesn't exist. And it's like, and this is in Sydney. So uh, it's, just, it's, it's just a real surprise. So the moral of the story is that once these things stop, that's it. There's no coming back. And I agree with what you said, uh, Jeffro, and definitely Aaron, that it's all well and good to have the ideas, but unless someone's prepared to take charge and make these things happen, it won't happen. And the experience level of people who know how to make these things happen uh, is now starting to dwindle as well. So it's all well and good saying, oh, let's run a fan club. But he's like, well, how do you do that? We've no idea. What's the process? Don't know. Uh, and then mm -hmm. if you do start something up, and there are plenty of clubs in history that have started and then just petered out after a year or two because they had no sustainability. And uh, that's also a very, very sad situation. So, uh, yeah, having something created is one thing and then getting it to last that's that's hard work, and of course you're fighting continually, trying to get bodies into your gigs. Unless, of course, you do the thing and you don't have meetings at all. And um, every club should be able to survive if they, even if they have to cancel their club meetings and say we'll go just um, our newsletter only for the next couple of years while we rebuild ourselves. They can certainly do that. So it has to be pretty serious for a club to actually shut down. But uh, unfortunately, it does happen. So there you go. Um, I'm just reading what's going on here. Uh... One of the uh, one of the comments that uh, Kel made was the fact that you know, as president, and he always used to um, speak to the new members and such. And I think that's probably one of the strengths of the club is when you have uh, a president and a, and a committee that is willing to socialise. And I know you, Dags, made a point of that sort of with Star Walking. You would go up to you know new people and introduce yourself and say hello and. Um, so if you don't have a, um, uh, a group of people that's willing to commit to be social, then um, I think a, a club's going to fail. And I sort of uh, remember one club in particular where there was all these little niche groups uh, like this clique, this clique, this clique, this clique. That almost felt like high school in so much as that you couldn't really feel social because uh, if you were coming into a club, you didn't belong to any of the cliques. So you had to almost have somebody welcome you and sort of invite you in before you really felt social about it. So um, mm. that's that's probably one of the, the strengths of some of these clubs now is that people do actually uh, uh, encourage you to join in and become friends. Yeah, once upon a time, a club could, sorry, MPS, uh, there was a, once upon a time you could have a situation where you didn't think, oh, my members, if I lose a couple, it doesn't matter, they'll all get replaced. Now members are pretty precious uh, and very important to you. So you've really got to hang on to them uh, whenever you can. MPS, go for it, mate. I was going to say, similar to what Jeffrey said, I remember going to a function for the X-Files fan club here in Melbourne back oh, in the right. 90s, uh, and it was a barbecue on the Yarra, if I remember yeah. correctly, mm. and didn't know anyone else there. It was just me and my then-at-the-time girlfriend. We, we turned up and basically didn't have anyone to speak to, didn't know anyone, didn't know what the story was, who was in charge or any of that sort of stuff, and, yeah, it was a little bit sort of... Um, I wouldn't say daunting, but it was certainly not friendly. It wasn't a friendly environment. It didn't make me want to, want to jump up and go, oh, my God, this was the most awesome thing in the world. So, And it wasn't until I joined uh, Star Walking that the exact opposite occurred. You know, was Everyone was friendly, but I knew a couple of the guys before I walked in the door, so that didn't hurt either. Um, a few things I just want to comment on that have been written down. Uh, so Catherine had said about she agreed with uh, Aaron in the fact that audience members can contribute and not just sit and be talked at. Uh, that's true, but there are some audience members who just like to sit and be entertained, and we've seen it firsthand. They'll come into a club meeting, plonk themselves down, look at the screen, even if there's nothing on the screen, and it's sort of like saying, well, entertain me. That's what I'm here for, and they don't want to contribute for whatever reason, uh, and that's, of course, their property. They're entitled to do that, uh, and I guess you just have to accept that not everybody is going to be um, as socially uh, forward-thinking or forward active as other people will be. Um, uh, yeah, and I agree. Yeah, talking to new people these days especially is actually very, very important to try to bring them on board. The, tr the reality is with a fan club, as I've always said before, like many, many times, getting people to their first club meeting is relatively easy. Getting them to the second one, that's the hard part. 
And if they don't come back for the second one, then you can say, yeah, they didn't they didn't like it. They came along and said, oh, it's awesome, I love it. Walk out the door, never see them again. And uh, But if they come back for the second time, then there's a good chance there'll be a third and a fourth or fifth and whatever else. So that second time is actually more important than the first time. So, uh, And there are definitely occasions where people can be very intimidated when they turn up to a gig not knowing what to expect. I have known of people especially women who've brought their friend along because they didn't know what to expect. They thought the place was going to be full of dorks. And uh, they've brought um, their wingman with them, or wing lady, uh, just to see what things are like. And it's a shame that people have to think that way. But unfortunately, that's um, that's a reality. Uh, and, yeah, the Quantum Leap fan club, that was started by one guy called Nick Bird. Uh, I think he did it more of a, as a gag than anything else. I had a couple of meetings here and there, but clearly he moved off on to other things and it was never going to last because nobody else was going to take it on. So uh, hence the reason why that didn't have the um, sustainability that uh, it may have had had it been a much bigger and popular um, event. And uh, fandom politics, yeah, well, the problem always is, and this is a, a key issue, and this happened a lot in the early days, if you're a brand-new person coming in, as Jeffro said, you sort of didn't know anybody, and yet all these groups all seem to know each other, and you're clearly the outsider. Um, and if you didn't think, oh, who do I break, which group do I break into, because they all know each other, they're all friends, and it can be very, very difficult for a club to sometimes realise, oh, you actually do have first-time people in the audience, and you've got to be able to make sure that they feel like they're being brought into um, into the show rather than just being left out because everybody else is so well established and that's always been the issue. But as I used to say to people, every single person in a fan club meeting, once upon a time, it was their first gig, regardless of how popular. I mean, even I had my first meeting back in 1985 and I remember vividly, we all sat in a room in a circle. This was January 1985 at Austrick. And it was like an AA meeting. That's what it felt like. And everybody's getting introduced to everybody else. And I was the outsider, but it was enough for me to still come back. So uh, uh, there you go. And fortunately, the way things uh, uh Yes. Uh, who was it? NPS? I think you were going to say something. Is that right? No. No. Cool. Jeffro, we're going to kind of wrap this up. And Tickers is now 9.30. So anything else you want to add in, Jeffro? No. Otherwise, uh, there's been some interesting comments in the, uh, the chat, some things that sort of... Uh, Remind you of the good old days, like uh, travelling by public transport to uh, to houses where the meetings were and such. And mm. uh, um, yeah, I remember uh, fandom politics. Unfortunately, you know, right. I was meat and the sandwich for a few things like that. So uh, it is what it is. But um, it's better than having nothing at all, I guess, in some yeah. respects. And that's the key thing. There is definitely a place in the world for fan clubs and for social club meetings, and they are actually important for people who want to socialise. And, of course, you don't realise just how important they are until you reach situations like we're going to have in the next three hours where we're socially isolated from everybody. And video conferencing can only go so far. And I agree with what MPS said earlier. If we were all in the same room together, the dynamic would be far different. So this is a great compromise, but it's not as good as because, you know, human beings are social animals. Uh, than being together in one location. So that's definitely something uh, well worth uh, considering. So uh, long may the fan clubs uh, live. So there you go. Um, all right, so we're about, it's 9.30. We're going to wrap this up. Now, EPS, did you want to say something? I think... Yes, we need to pick a year for next week. Oh, okay, we'll do this quickly then. So, okay, everybody pick a year for uh, next week for us to highlight. So give you a few seconds to write something down. Nothing from 2000. No, I, I now have a list. So I can actually knock off exactly what we've done. So every time you say you a year, I'm going to say no, yes, or whatever, and I'm going to try and pick them away from others. Eventually, we're going to do like 87, 85, That's 91, right. 92, 93. So, but yeah. uh, for the time being, give me some years from 1950 to 2009. There we go. Actually, Take yeah. the first one that's come up, 1963. That works for me. 63? Done. Yeah, we can do that. Done. Done. There we go, 1963 it is. It's a Jeffro year. It's a Jeffro year, very good. Um, all right, so we're going to wrap up now. It's just gone sort of just after 9.30. We've still got like two and a half hours before uh, like the cell, the walls go up. Um, MPS, any final words you want to mention? Uh, no, nothing from this side of things, but um, six weeks will go quick, guys and girls. Yeah. Yeah, and if you get stuck, just come back in next week and uh, join us. And uh, just, oh, my God, I can't handle it anymore. Jeffro, any final words, mate? No, not much. Um, stay safe, um, do the right thing, and um, we look forward to seeing all you guys uh, next week on the uh, the show. Very good. So there you go. Put the word out for anybody who's out there looking for someone or some people to talk to. Uh, so come and join us next Wednesday at 8 o'clock, okay? So all you guys watching this now know about us, but we need to spread the word to others out there who desperately need a bit of nerdy talk. What can I say? And with that in mind, make sure you all... <gasps> 
Don't forget to check the YouTube channel. Stay nerdy. Okay. All right. See ya. See ya.